and it's also recording. And here's everyone coming in. Hi, Daniel. Hi, Nicola. Hey, everyone. Hey, Tom. Hey, Graham. I was going to say nice to see you, but nice to see your avatar and your name. <laughs> we can't see you today. Hey everyone, welcome. Andrew frozen. Yeah, I think he froze. There he goes. There he goes. Best league plans, everybody. You know Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it moved a little bit. Oh, he's there we go. Almost. Hey guys, if you're just coming in, uh, we're just working on the internet oh, here. Am I here? No. Oh, there oh. we go. We can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you now. You guys still there? Am I, I'm, I'm, now, I'm now second guessing if I'm here or not. You're definitely here. <laughs> yeah, definitely here. You're right we'll tag, there. We'll tag team it. If, if you freeze, I'll jump in. Okay. Hey, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for coming in on a, a sunny evening. We'll just wait a few minutes, just let everyone come in. You're very silent, Rachel, Keenan, Sandy. Yeah. Just, Sorry. Awesome. We're just creating it, the creating I'm just appreciating, story. yeah. Just appreciating the moment. You know? I'm totally confused as to when I'm visible and audible or not, so I'm just waiting till people point to me. <laughs> <laughs> no. <We're> not. <laughs> so is that cool. it? Yeah, I think we're good. Yeah, let's get started and let's then we'll let people started. trickle in as they come in. Brilliant. Well, so glad you could all make it. Welcome. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Rachel, um, Rachel Brown, and I'm just going to go through a little bit of what we're going to do tonight. Um, for those of you that have joined us, you're more than welcome, and this is the third in our series of webinars. Some key housekeeping points, so we will finish bang on six o'clock. Some of the sessions that we've done previously, it's been fed back that it's really helpful just to have that solid hour. There's lots of other things going on. People are negotiating a whole range of other things around work and play and children and dinner and all that. So we will finish bang on six o'clock. Um, with us is myself, Andrew Doby, Keenan and Sandy Thompson. And we will be kind of getting you through the whole session. At the very bottom, you'll see there's a chat box. Please put your Q&A in there. Um, you can either directly uh, text us um, individually or you can do it to the whole group. It doesn't really matter. But we'll pick it up. On the Q&A, though, you can upvote questions. So if somebody asks a cool question that, that you want Sandy to answer, you can upvote it. Um, and either myself or Keenan will jump in and do that. So before I hand over to Andrew, just to give you a quick overview, um, I'm part of the Creative Entrepreneurs Club. For those of you who haven't seen us or joined us yet, please check it out. Um, it's a brilliant resource uh, that we've put together quite frantically, um, or we've upskilled, we've changed it, we've shiggled it about quite frantically over the last five weeks. So we hope it's starting to be more and more useful for the creative community at this challenging, difficult, opportunistic and quite frankly brilliant time. There's a lot of good stuff going on as well as a lot of challenging stuff going on. The focus of the network though is to create an environment where we all feel supported and able to take our businesses and our portfolio careers forward. So 
I'll hand over to Andrew. He's there on my screen. He might be somewhere different on yours. Um, whichever one of us is speaking is the one that you'll see. Um, so if we start giggling, we might have been making faces to each other. So just kind of throw that in there. But Andrew, over to you. Thanks, Rachel. And hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. I, I can't actually believe when you say five weeks, it feels like, you know, one long day. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, th I feel like I've been on a webinar. Definitely today, I've been on a webinar pretty much all day. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you have been uh, like that as well. So thank you very much for joining this one and coming to hang out with us for an hour. We'll try and keep it entertaining. We'll try and keep it educational. We'll try and kind of bring some sort of value to you as well. So for those who don't know me, um, I run um, a creative agency in Glasgow called Made Brave. Um, and we also run a content agency over in um, Edinburgh called Campfire. Um, Rachel and myself, a few weeks ago, a uh, few days ago, a few, uh, however long ago, we don't know anymore. Um, we, we, we joined forces. We created the Creative Industry COVID support group on um, LinkedIn which has now had over 3,300 uh, members, um, which is really great. If you've not gone over there, jump over onto LinkedIn, just search for, search for Creative Industry COVID Support. And there's a whole load of people sharing um, knowledge, uh, trying to give each other work and jobs and kind of uh, point each other in the direction of loans and grants and such like. And then Rachel um, and her organization, Creative Entrepreneurs Club, as she mentioned, has opened up her platform completely free of charge for any of you guys to join. We've now had 820 people come over there and join on this from I believe 42 cities um, uh, and you know over there on that platform we're offering free one-to-one -one support so you can book time with me you can book time with Rachel and um, believe you can book time with Keenan and a whole host of other helpers and mentors and um, that uh, you know you can pick our brains at whatever you would like to pick our brains at, and, and if we can help you we will try our best to do so um, I had a few sessions today um, and just remember it's really easy jump over there and you can just book people's time so don't be scared to do that we're all here and we're trying to kind of help each other along the way as well um, so with these webinars obviously we're trying to pull together people we know that can maybe bring some value to you we're trying to bring some some knowledge and some help to you at this time um, last week, we had John Latham, um, who's a qualified coach, um, a mentor, and a consultant with over 30 years in the creative and tech industries. Um, he spent a lot of time um, giving us some practical advice around mental health and self-care. Um, if you haven't seen that, you can go back and watch that on the Creative Entrepreneurs Club website, or you can go and check back on LinkedIn on my profile, the Made Brave profile, Creative Entrepreneurs profile, or somewhere. We were, previous to that, we also had... Mark Logan, who is the former COO of Skyscanner, and he talked a lot about resilience and some really nice um, practical advice as well for how to kind of get your, uh, I suppose, your mindset through this and um, turn um, turn it into some sort of proactivity and, and make sure that you head for success rather than the opposite. Um, so, you know, today we wanted to get, you know, obviously um, a lot of the, the, the effort that we've built these groups around are around creativity. I run a creative, creative business and Rachel's business is focused around supporting the creative industries. And often creativity and, and business is, is seen as two very polar opposite things um, and and we want to talk and we want to bring sandy on today because we want to talk a little bit about how that doesn't have to be the case and often we're using the same skill sets um when doing or when being creative and trying to create a um, problem solve as we are in business and you know i've spoken to a lot of creative people over the last few weeks that have you know maybe had challenging times um, works disappeared pipelines dried up etc and often um, they're thinking that you know their, 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 their skill set is not useful at this time and how are we going to get work when everyone else is looking for work but I think there's never been a better time in a sense to be creative because to, to solve problems and to, to solve big problems and little problems uh, we need creative minds and so you know you guys that have joined us in this session today are obviously creatively um, minded and I suppose we want to, you know, part of the discussion today, we'll be talking about how we can use that skill set to help, um, to, to help, uh, you know, better ourselves just now and to, to help make sure that we survive and not only survive, but thrive through this time. So, um, yeah, no, um, I'll pass you back over to Rachel, who will give a little bit of a, a more formal welcome to Sandy and explain what she does. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Andrew. Thank you. So those of you just joining us, we're doing a quick interview with Sandy Thompson. And we're going to probably focus in on the power of creativity and nurturing talent, as well as everything else that goes with that. We're going to have a Q&A. Um, if you just joined us, I mentioned that before. So please make sure you post your questions down. This is not, it's, there's no such thing as a silly question. And there's no such thing as the wrong question. Sandy is up for everything. So those of you who don't know Sandy, um, Sandy's a filmmaker, a writer, a theatre director, a performer, 
um, a supporter, a fierce supporter of creativity. Um, she has a huge track record um, of success, but more importantly, she has a huge track record of being in the position to spot things that other people don't. So she's a coach, she's a mentor, she has been a real rock for many people in the creative sector, um, probably spanning the last 15, 20 years. Mm. Be generous, a little longer, <laughs> but you'll say 15, 20 years. Um, Sandy regularly receives five star reviews. This, the work that she does through Poor Boy and, and Poor Boy Stories, she'll tell you a bit about that, I'm sure. Um, really powerful stuff. And if you've not checked any of that out, um, please do. She has split her time up until recently between America and Scotland, jumping around doing a whole range of um, different exciting stuff and I'll leave her to tell, her, tell us all about her Nashville um, excitement uh, last November which we were particularly proud of her um, in all things. She is creative, she's committed and I think more importantly she's brilliant. Um, she has been going through a whole range of emotions like all of us recently and we've talked a lot about it around how do you remain creative and positive when you feel like your tank is, is limited and how do you create commercial success um, and creative success at a time when you're just being stretched and stretched and stretched. So we wanted to bring Sandy's expertise to you um, tonight but as I say please use the time to ask any question you want to ask um, and Sandy will, shoot, will answer it. So Sandy, thank you so much for being here. I'm going to hand over to Andrew, uh, who's going to kick us off. Andrew? Hey. Yeah. So hi, Sandy. Um, and, you know, I suppose uh, thanks, Rachel, for that, that intro there. There was obviously lots of uh, ways of describing you there. So I'm keen to hear just first of all, um, how you describe yourself and what, what is it you do? So I describe myself as a story engineer because I work in so many different um, art forums but fundamentally all of them are about telling stories or helping someone else tell a story so sometimes I will go in and I'm like helping make a story work and I'm working as an editor or a dramaturg or I'm working with people who have that thing where they go I'm not creative and you, you know that that is fundamentally not possible to be a human being in the world and not be creative and I'm like helping pull the stories out of them. Um, so for, initially I trained in theatre and for, I, I went to drama college and I, I, was, a, I was a director for, of just of theatre and a writer for theatre for 20 odd years. And because I guess as the child of someone who ran their own company, I have always sat at that bit where I've never really seen the difference. So my dad was a design engineer for the oil industry and my mum was his QA and systems manager back like when that was all just coming in so like post-its over tea time was just my life from like 12 13 and I, I, I was surprised as I grew into my career to realize that everybody didn't think that these were exactly the same kinds of skills um, that I was having so a lot of the time I often what I think of it as is I'm a, I'm a, I'm a person, I, I am the kind of person who does a job that normally doesn't start until there's a bunch of people in the room. So like okay. fundamentally, it can be a lot of things. It could be gigging with the blues band or it can be like directing something, but usually like there's a posse gets together and then that's where the work happens. And let's say the other side is about working with the stories that come out of that. And literally, if you think of those as two rocks that you can crash together, I feel like I've done, I've crashed those rocks together in just about every conceivable way. Um, from kind of audio drama to play the city games. And then I was a huge comic book fan. So I got to get involved in a comic book um, mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. And that was like genuine fangirl stuff where I finally got, I've been on my to-do list for a long time. Fantastic, fantastic. And I suppose, um, you know, obviously, impacts of COVID on, on most businesses are, you know, and, and most people are, you know, there's some sort of challenge. I'm, I'm just interested, I suppose, just to understand how, how that's coming to your world, you know, how that's affecting you. Yeah, well, because, you know, when you when you start out, you're almost always a community worker in something like theatre. You're usually working with like young people or what have you. And I used to share job share with a visual arts worker. And she used to say, I get so pissed off, Sandy, because I have like boxes of stuff that I have to arrive with a workshop. And you have like a bouncy ball and a whistle. And then if everybody else just shows up, it'll be fine. And you've got your, yeah, and there is no packing to do with theatre. But the problem is that, at the point where people can't physically get into a room together, I feel like particularly live performance hit the wall really fast because 
we realized that that was like an inherent part of our offer is the fact that, you know, and as, as someone who does a lot of work that breaks the fourth wall, I, you know, I think of my film work as stuff that sits inside a box. And I think of my stage work as stuff that comes off the stage and gets involved in the audience. And if you don't have living, breathing bodies in there, that's immediately an issue. So I feel like um, certainly the first sets of conversations that I had when all this kicked off was uh, with my theatre cohort, because they were all looking at the, the reality of not only how you present a live performance, but also like many industries, theatre does amazing PR at looking like something that's a fully fledged industry when it's four rabbits in a coat, like <laughs> pretending to be a person. So like every venue, every production company, and it, like it's going like hell underneath to like, create the professional persona that makes it look like it's all going on and we do we had FOMO before there was social media like we got reviews in national theatre and gave everybody FOMO that way way before there was such a thing as putting a picture up on Instagram so there's a, a real double whammy of like a, a kind of an industry that's only ever a couple of weeks away from financial disaster mm -hmm. but married with the fact that like professionalism and not showing where the cracks are being something that you kind of take in as an industry standard from the very beginning and it's kind of unthinkable to go do you know this is really unworkable mm -hmm. and because to be honest for example if production staff or actors said that all the theaters in the country would shut immediately i can talk to i could point you to 25 people who regularly do the impossible and just call it a job so, you know, in, in an industry like that, what happens is there's not a lot of water under the boat. You know, people as organizations, you know, the venues and things are programming so solidly into the sort of two years in advance that as people began to see things beginning to get canceled, the very real danger was them knowing that there wasn't a space later on, like the longer this goes on, mm. the less space there is for those things that got canceled. Um, at the time, and for lots of people, you know, these were breakthrough gigs. Sometimes I've spoken to so many people where like, this was the one they'd worked for three years to like get this one opportunity. And then what are you actually meant to do on the day that it was meant to happen and you are stuck inside the house, bouncing off the walls. So, you know, all of those kind of things, a theater industry that only recently worked out what maternity leave was. Um, for example, like, you know, we, uh, the whole, most of our, most of the theatre industry, a bit like film, you're on project contracts. You know, a lot of the time you're going from short term pay contract to, you know, or you're self-employed and you're contracting in other self-employment. And what that means is there's no one silver bullet safety net. As we all fall, instead of forming a ring so that we're like the parachute going down, everybody just went down again individually. Mm -hmm. So uh, some of the things that I've, i find that I'm doing, partly with my uh, creative entrepreneur's hat on. I mean, this job is such a gift. It's such a fabulous thing to be allowed to talk to people across every conceivable discipline and be able to say to someone, do you know what? Everyone's having that problem or that's just your sector that has that issue. So let's talk about your sector or yeah, okay, maybe this is the situation you're in because people don't know because part of our professional persona is that you mustn't ever show weakness. And therefore, there's this thing where there's not an honest dialogue. And I kind of feel like my entire, you know, my job all the way through any of the industries I've worked in has been the person who's put the balloon up and gone, I, this doesn't work, this isn't working, there's something wrong here. And, and advertising the fact that you can be critically successful and you can make critically acclaimed work and still, be short of money in a way that means that every time I got a five-star review in any national paper, I would get nervous putting my bank card in the hole in the wall because the time the reviews are coming out is about the time that my bank card's going to get eaten. So like it, it had happened on so many projects that like I became superstitious about taking money out of the bank before the reviews came out because I knew that that was almost always the project end of project fees hadn't come in. I'd subbed everybody else because I'm the boss, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, if that's something that you can be doing and I've been doing that for decades, you know, the, the, the reality is that as you, as you get older, you choose to build or not build a cushion behind yourself. 
you know, and, and I stayed out there as a freelancer a lot longer than most people my age go into big organizations. But in reality, you know, and in addition to everything else, I want to make the work I want to make. And I, I'm not great at people telling me what that work could be. So I, you know, had chosen independence over financial security again and again like that was put on the table every other year I kept saying no as things came up and the thing is that happens you know that's that's the price of admission for some industries I think sometimes artists internalize the idea that they're failing at something when in reality scarcity is on the part of the people doing the delivery is the model for the industry and the industry is just keeping quiet about that so I think it's really important to have really honest and open conversations about finances about how people manage things because in in reality i think people sometimes think it's them you know sandy where do you look for inspiration who are your heroes you've got loads of things going on <laughs> who, where do I, where do i look for inspiration i I am I'm a great curator. Like I was I was lucky. To, it's, it's important to know what your specific special like your 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 special set of Liam Neeson skills are. And and one of mine is putting together a room of people who do amazing stuff. So there is a thing where I feel like the, the people that inspire me are the ones that you, you walk into a room and there's some people that just seem like they have this red light on their head that's like, I will go the extra mile and get so excited about this shit that you won't be able to stop me doing the work. And like, I've, I've developed over the years an ability to gather those people together. And I think that's the thing is that, you know, there's no word in the English language for what it is to be kicking 50 and be working with the 25 year old where you're like, you are a pistol. Like you're already a pistol. I wasn't like that till I was 40. You're gonna be amazing. So like, I get a lot of it from, I get a lot of it from that. Um, I get a lot of it from, you know, the, the, so the, the, the actors and the production staff that I'm, I'm working with. And I did, you know, that is an example taken from when I was doing the, 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 sh the film shoot in uh, Nashville. My producer was 23. I can't even remember 23. I'm not going to lie. And I like, and, and she was just a machine. She was amazing. And I do genuinely like look at the amount of road that I've covered. I'm like, they're going to need to build her a bigger runway, you know, like it's, and that kind of stuff genuinely gets me excited. I think the other thing uh, that is as a collective and I guess that's the thing is that I make work for audiences like whatever it is whether it's one audience of a person hearing something in their ears or whether it's like you know 2,000 people in a stadium it doesn't matter and the the people who think that the thing that I do is not that is not for them and then discovers that it really is I think there's a thing about being open to new experiences um, and, and like my greatest joy is walking like a foyer after one of my plays and listening in to all the conversations that people are having where you know that you've put something in there where you're like, dad is going to have to talk to her about that now because that subject's not going away. And I, you know, like that kind of stuff and the people who are bold enough to have the conversation. So I think it's that. I think it's the, I think these are the things fundamentally. It's difficult to have um, real heroes in the film industry because so many of them turned out to be sex offenders. You know, so like it just in the, you know, I used to, I used to cite Terry Gilliam a lot about like how radical he was about his work, but he's an arse and you have to be willing to like to throw people over for going, no, if you're going to say something like that and be a fud, I'm not interested. So like, there's a real thing now where I don't, you know what I mean? Like a lot of the heroes that I had that were kind of industry heroes have properly been given enough rope to hang themselves. And my generation in particular, I know you know this, Rachel, like they fared badly. Guys of 50 failed really badly in film and in theater. And, and sadly, mostly it's guys who are in charge and have their names on things in film and theater. So there's a lot of, do you know what I mean? There's a, there's a lot of people that kind of went by the wayside quite recently. You work a lot with different people, Sandy, and I know that you support a lot of people. It's, it's great to hear you getting excited about young talent and people coming through. And, and I suppose there's two questions that are coming through from, from uh, Q&A and, and from, from us. 
-hmm. So how do we nurture and develop that talent and, and give that talent increased confidence during this particularly challenging time? And is mentorship important? Do you, do you feel that's an important um, route or skill? I think there is, I think there is, you can't have a fangirl conversation with, I say this personally, you can't have a fangirl conversation that goes any further than, I think you're amazing, that's great, thanks. And the conversation stops. Like to get anything useful out of somebody, you have to engage with them as a person. And I think that there is a, a thing about mentorship that makes it much easier for people to do that because they understand then that it's a journey. We are so rough on ourselves. Like I say, even before social media, we would take the four high points in somebody's journey and spin ourselves a fiction that that was what their journey was really like and that they never sat in their car and bawled their eyes out at any point. You know, like mm. the reality is that we do that to ourselves. And, and the fundamental of nurturing talent has to be, it's the same as in my rehearsal room. Like we always say in my rehearsal room, is that if you made a mistake, then that is a sign that's never going to count against you because it's the sign that you didn't just bring your tricks and you didn't just do what you were good at. You tried something and you didn't know if it would work. And whilst there are a lot of rehearsal processes that want you to bring your tricks and, and do your good thing, we're fundamentally more interested in the people who venture and try something and stretch themselves. To do that, you have to be willing to also fall on your arse in the room and show people there's no safe space. Like, I don't get to be hit and sit, and sit in the denny and not actually also do the same. So I think that there's a fundamental in mentoring and making connections between people is, is how any business really runs. So as a, you know, we call it networking, we call it lots of things. It's just about talking to people. And I, I think that the more that you can demystify, I think what happens is that a lot, especially with artists, you know, I saw this, I saw this Venn diagram once that said unbridled arrogance, chronic self crippling self doubt, and in the middle it had artist, in the like where those two things overlap, and I was like that, you know, I was like okay, called out, like that's absolute, that makes lots of sense, and I think the thing of having those two extremes because you can only make work if you are bold enough to venture things, it's amazing how that boldness then deserts an artist when confronted with anything that doesn't sit right inside the box of practice. And I think that that's partly because we're used to being really talented and good at something and doing it, and then it hasn't always been a good process to feel like you're having to learn something. And I think that's what nurturing talent is. It's about showing your learning process to someone else. It's about being open about the things that do and do not work for you that you have and haven't succeeded at. But also being outside of someone allows you to look at where they're getting in their own way. So I'm going to use the example of this incredible producer that I worked with that I was so taken with and who recruited my my entire director's unit. Like she did a fabulous job. And we were driving to the set one day and she said, you know, but you've got, even though you're newish to film, you know, I've only been doing film three or four years. She said, you know, you've got that whole pedigree to get you in there. People will let you in. No one's going to let us in. And I was like, right, nobody's going to let you in anywhere. Like get punchy because actually no one will do it out of guilt or a sense of obligation. You, ha you know, you, you have to go in and make your space. And it was, heartbreaking to break the news to this incredibly talented hard-working girl that hard work wouldn't be enough because I know that fundamentally we want it to be like we want it to be enough but the price of admission is that you have to it's like endless never being allowed to get away from first date like being an artist is to perpetually be stuck on your first date forever asking someone if they want to go out with you and and you have to maintain that level of insane bravery throughout and I think that, that sometimes nurturing talent is about giving people permission to do that um, so on that shoot I did that whole shoot without swearing anyone who knows me will be like I did two weeks I didn't swear once it was a miracle but it was also I've, I've only known you for half an hour and you've already sworn <laughs> about four, 400 times <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe that I mean whilst under stress and whilst trying to <laughs> I'm like 
you know, I'm a third generation barmaid. It's in my DNA. <laughs> and, but I realized that I, I was the same age as some of these people's grands. Like I literally, you know, like I was nearly the same age as like two generations up. And I'm like, okay, there's a persona they're talking to that if I cut across it, it's really rude. So you have to also understand where people's limits are and help them beyond them. Mm. So I, I, you know, to use this, this uh, producer as an example, I am like every young woman I know in the, interest, uh, the industry at some point or other, she was also working really hard facilitating a bloke's career for him. And I sat down with her and I was like, you don't have time to do both. Like you have time to facilitate mm. yourself. He needs to make his own phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and whilst trading is brilliant, like trading is great, I think there is a thing, uh, and I do a lot of mentoring, especially with young women in the industry, because I think that there is an assistant position that women often get stuck in or a facilitatory position. Um, and I have always been out there going, no, I am the artist in the room. I'm leading this room and I am the artist. And I now do that as a political act because people need to see a woman in, ch you know, young makers need to see a woman in charge of the room unapologetically not cajoling people into doing things but like making the space and making it happen so again in some ways that is the other way I mentor it's like anyone that's done a project with me is watching that and they also know that I'm asking the earth like you don't come on my stuff unless you want to get broken like there's not it's it's not uh, you know, it's not a come in at nine, leave at five. And the interviews and, and chats with people are always based on like, this will look amazing on your CV and you will be buckled by the time we're finished with you. So like, you have to be ready for that, do you know? Um, so I suppose that's, uh, you know, I think that in return, people get to ask what they want from me at the end of the project. And if that means an ongoing mentoring relationship or you know like sometimes it's not about it's not just about money changing hands mm. sometimes it's about something much more and it's about access and getting to the glass ceiling or getting to the table isn't enough you have to carry a ladder <laughs> for everybody else <laughs> to yeah. make sure that they can get there can, can, I, can I jump in with a, a question here? So Caitlin has popped in a question, Sandy. Um, uh, you know, you, you mentioned earlier on that a lot of creatives, a lot of artists, a lot of people in theatre and, you know, all sorts of creativity often live hand to mouth, project to project. Yeah. Um, and a lot of, you know, companies, agencies, businesses do the same mm -hmm. as well. And yeah. you know, so, so a lot of people right now have had that rug taken out from their, you know, under their feet. You know, right. you, you mentioned a lot of people maybe had shows that were their, you know, this was the ones where they made it and it's been taken away. And obviously just now, you know, to, to, to help get any work that is out there, um, you know, we need to stay creative, we need to stay vocal, we need to stay front of mind. Um, but often that, that's hard when you're in fight or flight mode. That's hard when, you know, when you're, when you're actually just struggling to feed yourself, feed your family, etc. And you talked about it definitely with a bank card and not knowing if there's going to be money there, if the card's going to be swallowed. I suppose, is there any practical advice for people right now that, that have had work dry up completely? I've spoken to a lot of people over the last couple of weeks that just work has vanished and there is no work for them. And, okay. you know, how, how, how can they stay creative? How can they use the creative um, skills they have to, you know, mm -hmm. to help generate work, to help make sure that they're, they're the ones that get the work, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think, well, I think the first thing is always to remember that work goes to people as much as it goes to applications and CVs, yep. especially just now. So I think that one of the things is to sit down and map, and I want to say network, but really the word is just your people, like just map your people, whether that's professional or not professional. And then start looking at the conversations you want to have. Because the, the reality is that lots and lots of people who normally you can't get to are stuck inside and ready to have a chat right now. So I had a really resourceful, I had a, I had a girl contact me on Twitter, I had a woman contact me on Twitter. Um, actress transitioning into um, directing, hasn't done her first directing gig yet. Contacted me on Twitter and she's like, just thought maybe you've got a bit of spare time just now really keen to talk to very specific Scottish female directors. So it wasn't like a, a broad based thing. Um, wondered if you had time for a half hour chat. We were on the phone for the whole of my lunch. Like that, you know, just like anything I had, she could have it. And she'd said, yeah, it was my flatmate who was like, do you know what? People can't get to their work. They'd like to have a chat about it. Like yeah. they like to talk about what they do. And I was like, you are going to be fine. You know, like the, the and the reality was that 
it was a specific request that I could say yes or no to. So like vaguely waving at people doesn't do anything. Like what you have to yeah. do is know whether you're going in Zen and it's about let's just check in with the relationship because that's legit and that's fair and that's good to do. And it's good for you to do. Do you know, it's good for yourself to be in conversation with other people about their experiences. Then there's a point where you have to be specific. What are you looking for? What is it that you believe they could do for you? Can you get it down to a yes, no, maybe? Because even if they say no, there's an implied but at the end. No, but because you've given them something small enough to think about. For people in particular, so like actors um, have spoken to me a lot because that really is an industry that got hit hard. You know, if you think of it like an actor who's told to um, improvise about anything, they can't do it. You can't ask an actor to just get up and do anything. They'll freeze. But if you say to them, can you be a lighthouse manager at four o'clock in the morning whose light's just gone out in the middle of a storm and he's eating a fish supper? Immediately, <laughs> Do you know, and that's it. Specifics make it so much easier yeah. for people to be imaginative. So like, don't give them the sea to swim in, give them a swimming pool that they can actually like swim in. And between you, you'll find the thing that you can do. I think the other thing in a really, really practical way is practice being your own manager and your own artist. And like, have those two people be discrete, different people in your head and if you can give them opposite ends of the kitchen table so like the artist gets time and space and the manager gets time and space now if you think of it like it was somebody else that you were we've all been in those relationships with managers and artists where like i so i'm in my i'm in my producer office just now so i'm our company producer i go out i hustle for the work i fund the work that's what this one does. there's a porch downstairs that the writer lives in and the producer is not allowed to come down and bitch at the writer, why are you writing for nine actors? We can't afford nine actors. Because the writer just needs to write the bloody play and she needs the producer to get out of her face. Equally, if the producer is on the phone and, and giving it hustle, the writer can't be lying on the ground going, I just need another two weeks because I just, I'm not ready to finish it yet. Like, these two women need to have like a respectful relationship where they understand each other's boundaries. Otherwise they'll be all hell up and it doesn't matter that they're both in my head. So in, in lots of ways, what I would say as an artist is like, have a chat, a, ha, listen to the dialogue that's happening. Because mm. if your manager is waking you up at three in the morning and telling you that you're useless for getting sleep and you can't be ill, your manager needs sacked and you need a new manager. And equally, if your artist is like hiding under the table and won't come out, you're going to have to find ways to encourage the artist to come out and engage with the real world. And that really is like, to me, the people who are really sustainable in any ind industry, if they are, a, let's say it doesn't matter if they're an engineer, or a software designer, like anybody that's got an aspect of making and an aspect of managing that has a sustainable mm. career, usually has a really respectful dialogue between those two parts of their heads. And, and that's what then means that when a new situation comes up, you're like, okay, the team is on it, as opposed to like complaining at each other and crying in a corner, which, you know, you're also allowed to do. You just have to tell everyone you're doing it and then go do it. Love that. Great answer. <laughs> so, I, I was just going to ask, this, kind of following on to that, Sandy, because you're a brilliant leader and you talk about leadership. It just kind of trips off the tongue. And I just, I know that lots of people are really struggling at the moment because you might be the leader in an organisation or you just might be, as you described, the leader in your own life, trying to balance everything. Um, People are, people are really um, asking for support and help. So what would you say around leadership skills? I know that people have been reaching out to you even as of this afternoon yeah. around, can you help me get my sort of head in the game? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think there's, so I think there's a couple of different things around being leadership. And, and like the most important, th in some ways, if we think of it as we're in the airplane movie and it's been like, you know, lockdown's been like, you know, no one knows where it's going. We're not quite sure how we're coming out of it. We're literally at the scary bit of the disaster movie, you know, speaking narratively. And actually, the most important thing is that you put your own oxygen mask on first. Now, 
I say this over and over and over to people, but the thing with leaders is that they are used to never going under no matter what's happening. And that means that none of us are willing to admit that this is beyond what we're used to. Because I have spoken to so many who are like, I am just going to tough up, I'm just going to deal with it. And I'm like, this is, a, this is a global pandemic. And in reality, yes, you can use all of your fierce skills, but it is actually okay to be human first. And, and I think that what that means is, you know, if the oxygen mask falls down and is like, please put me on, please put me on, then just take a minute and do that. And I, I think that leaders do this double speak a lot of the time where they're great at saying they're doing it, whilst not actually doing it, because that would involve weakness. And none of us are very comfortable with that. So wherever it is, like find the space that is your oxygen, like whether it's a partner or it's not. I, I have a daily dance group, a choreographer that I know does a 10 minute disco at 10 o'clock every morning and she gets like 20 different arts workers on Zoom and they play disco music and we all just dance and stuff like that and it's like being my say so you know thank you EJP and Cultured Mongrel it was an inspired idea and almost everyone in that group is a leader where it really needs to blow off steam. I think the other thing is to be honest and set parameters around what you can and can't lead on. So the reality is that if you are responsible for people lots of us are responsible for other um, members of staff people might be arriving with more to unload. It's one thing to make the allowance and go, I know you can't do all the things you would do in a normal world. It's a completely different thing to be like, and I am the place where you can put all that stress. And I think that the first is fine. And the second is something that you need to design the sentence for. So I will often say things like, let's be realistic. Today, I've got bandwidth for A, B and C. Anything else, I'm happy for you to take time around, but this is what I've got bandwidth for. And what it means is you're setting the agenda for what people could, because people will find some place to put it, but if you're walking about offering, then people will put it wherever they want, you know. And in some ways, later on down the line, people will, 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 like, will be happier with the memory that they didn't blow everything all over you and like are able to work in a professional way with you because you set boundaries that allowed them to talk about the reality of stress without talking about the detail of the stress. And I think that's the thing is like, you have to acknowledge people and you have to hold space for the fact that I, I said earlier today, you know, I, I don't have children and I live in the countryside. I'm just shutting up when my cousin's phone, like I'm not in a city, I don't have three kids under the age of 15. I am just being quiet. I just locked out in terms of like available space. And uh, you know, it's that, it's the thing of, in that situation you go, fine, I've got the bandwidth. Tell me what's happened, it's fine, you know? And I think that's the thing is that, you know, relationships don't come with tabs that say professional, non-professional in the arts a lot of the time anyway. That's why we are so precious about having a professional reputation because it's so easy to slide if you're not careful because people are working very hard on things they care about very deeply. And that means heaven forfend you show up as a person. And the reality is it's great to show up as a person. We have a, we have a thing in our rehearsal room where we ask everybody to bring all of themselves and then not expect that to be the most important thing in the room. And that balancing act, like it sometimes takes people a few goes and you're like, but we say it out front so that people can have that, that understanding that yes, you know, we want all of you. We, you know, we're willing to acknowledge you're a person. We're not going to ever treat you like a number, but also that doesn't mean you can take up all the oxygen because we all have our stuff and we all have to keep moving. And I think that it's also, it's sometimes useful to, to, for leaders who don't normally to share where it is that they're at. Because if the difference is that somebody spends an hour listening to something you could tell your sister versus an hour getting a funding application in that'll save your ass and get everybody paid, do you know, then let them do the, then letting the boss do their job is actually your way, is your way of explaining to them that's how you're helping. Like that's, that is how you're helping. You're making the space safe. Um, so I think that that's, I think there's a, there's a lot of it around that. And I think the fact that people are finding this a kind of bereavement process, like I, I did a lot of stuff around bereavement counseling years ago. And like the, the point with things that are this unexpected is like, 
you know, people have lost gigs, yes. People can't see what's happening in the future. And we have an understanding that what we thought was normal is no longer being underwritten as normal. It might change completely. And all of those create like bereavement reactions in people. And the thing with bereavement is the stress responses you get aren't logical or sequential. And I think that's really important at this point is to recognize that you might get up one day as a leader, as an artist, with whatever description you put on yourself and discover that you got mugged by something that's not sequential and not logical, at which point the manager calling you a wuss is a shit tactic. Like it's not, it doesn't help anybody. So some days you will deal with things and some days you won't. And you are also allowed to be a person. It doesn't mean you're unprofessional. There's lots of ways of being professional while making space for what you can and cannot manage and therefore enabling what people can and cannot manage to be spoken about. Fantastic. Keenan, is there any questions popping up that you want to pull out just from the, the Q&A? Yeah, um, so there's one here from, from Misha um, and she's asking about, you know, uh, taking that first step from kind of a facilitator to an artist. Would you have any advice for Misha on that one? I mean, at the moment, like if you jump the net really well up here because people are engaging as people in a way that they haven't before. Like at the moment, there's this amazing window of opportunity because the reality is all bets are off. Like, you know, people in great big organizations don't know if their organization will weather the storm. Like everybody all of a sudden is dealing with a world that freelancers are much more used to where there's this kind of degree of risk underneath it. So in reality, you know, at, at this point, if you want to pivot into doing that and you've been looking at that anyway, now is a brilliant time to connect with people and be finite about what you want to do. So I think that if you're making the shift, I think the difference between facilitation and creativity in terms of within a professional field is that facilitation can be learned by someone else and you can emulate what someone else is doing. Creativity isn't. Nothing you do is going to look like what everybody else does. So be ready for that. And I think that's the one fundamental that you have to, you have to make your peace with before you move from that, that slightly more protected shore into what is it that I'm doing. Usually people have a sense of like what they want it to feel like or who they want to be in the room. So what I would say is interrogate the picture in your head that is the like little flash that you get of what that looks like. And the more you can interrogate it, the more you'll be able to pull out why is that in there. So like if you see that it happens in France, is that because there's like practitioners that you're desperate to work with there or do you just want to do it in the sunshine like is it a, you know so like the more you go why why is that in the picture the more you can begin to get a whole list of things that you go right if we could put all of these together that's what I'm moving towards in terms of my creative experience and I have a, and I think this is the thing is like no one ever made a shite piece of work when they were having a great time like if you build yourself a great process, then you will always come out with something better at the end of it. And I have sometimes saved shows where we've had a crappy process and I've managed to find something bonny at the end of it, but it has never been brilliant all the way through like a stick of rock, the way that something is if you build your process. So back to doing that thing of be mindful of your day, like be mindful of who do you want to connect with who do you find inspiring? What do you find inspiring? The entire world are offering free inspiration just now. There's a dozen different, I am on at the last count, seven different WhatsApp groups. I can't even keep up with them. Um, which are often things that are not my field. Like the thing that's really liberating is if you're nervous about making the jump to creative, do something that you legitimately feel you could be crap at. So I, the, the only drawing I do is storyboarding for film. And I live with a professional printmaker. So the house is full of toys and I can do whatever, the amount of mess that I've made in the last three weeks, because I'm just like playtime, having a playtime. But it ultimately, what it does is it gives you permission to get up every morning into that routine and be like, I have a creative practice that I'm doing today. Fundamentally, what you do have to do is you have to ask for things. Facilitation is about providing things, challenge, asking challenging questions of others, but being creative, 
means you have to stick your neck out and do the first date thing, not just for people that you're collaborating with, but also of yourself. You know, like that I'm halfway through writing a film that I really didn't want to have to revise the, the screenplay on like a few weeks ago. And it was for a big pitch, which didn't happen. You know, like it was for one of those big end of a, a, an event thing. And I realized, and I looked at it and went, oh God, it wants to be a thriller. Thrillers are so much work. Like plotting a thriller, it's like, it's just four more laps when I was nearly finished. And, and I desperately didn't want to have to do this work. And I'm like, I'm just going to be pissed off. I'm, like, I'm going to do it anyway. I might as well do it for the deadline. So, you know, I think the thing is be ready for that. Be ready for the fact that once you start the car and you turn the key, you're not actually holding on to the steering wheel. Something else in you is in charge of the steering wheel and you will you're a passenger. So you just have to get your, your idea, your, your head around that. You're taking all the risks. You don't get any of the control. It's really fun once you get used to it. So can you, can you certainly give us an idea when you're downstairs in that writing mode? Yes. Um, you know, can you give us a little bit of insight into your creative process? You know, that might help some people just now as well, just in terms yeah. of how your, your creative process works. And there is, there's a real advantage to me because my creative process is so distinct because if I'm directing, you can see I'm doing it. I've got to create a schedule for that for people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you're writing, there's definitely a thing where you're just, you're going down the rabbit hole and there's just you and the manager who's been locked out being like, don't do that. So like, it definitely is a different process. What I tend to do is that I, I literally have scraps of paper and buckets. So I have like these four buckets that sit in front of me because almost always I've learned my ideas show up and they are in fact, unless you're going to do a 30 part mini series, they are in fact more than one idea. And it's taken me years to accept that. So gradually what I do is I write down the little aspects of the ideas and I stick them in what I think are the different buckets. And then I basically use them like Lego. Do you know, so I, I start to like blue tack them to the, the floor in roughly the order and at this point i'm not a writer i'm the audience i'm like what would be fun next like what do i want to see next what needs to happen next i don't do i i have a technical approach that i will apply later but i'm big on the you know hemingway might have been an arse but the right drunk edit sober thing is a great idea like you you write unselfconsciously and then you go back after and i think the one way to make yourself miserable in any field is to try to create and edit at the same time just makes you want to die. So I've gotten really good at being like, that room is genuinely like, it's the mm. writer's room and nobody with a linear brain who knows when lunchtime is, has any business being in that room. <laughs> so like, that's the thing. So, and we've learned that the blue tack thing has to work because once my husband opened the back door and I lost a whole first act of a play and we just nearly divorced over it. So like, now I know we have to like nail these things to the floor so that we can move them around. But I'm also a person who needs to see everything. I don't work well, my, my creative partner. Um, so I have a co-writer I work with a lot who's an actor and associate director of Poor Boy, uh, Jeremiah Reynolds. And he's great. He's 15 years younger than me and totally at home on a computer. And I think I am just slowly driving him around the twist because I'm like, look, paper doesn't crash. I don't lose it. I, I, I like the tactile thing of it. I like being able to write in different colors and sizes. And ultimately I want the whole thing laid out on a wall or a floor so that I can stand above it and get like a God's eye view on what I'm doing. And I cannot write unless I can see that, if I can't get that overview. And I think people don't give themselves permission enough when they're brainstorming, when they're thinking about things creatively or problem solving, going to whole wall size is my default for everything. You know, and that helps you see everything that might be happening. And I think that once you see it all down on the wall, you're like, no wonder my head hurt. No mm. wonder that was sore. Look at all the stuff that's up there. And I do this regularly with clients that come in to see you see because they'll be thinking about expanding or making a business out of, you know, from the ground up. And once you've actually laid it out, they're like, holy smoke look at that you know and it, it's a whole business plan mm -hmm. it's just literally all been sitting in the back of their head and all i'm doing is asking questions and writing on post-its it's a really simple question and that's what my creative process is as well ask a question write the answer on a post-it ask a question write the answer on a post-it uh, and do you think you always need that sort of double act you know it's quite interesting you you, you co-write um and often you know and 
in my world, in the creative agency world, you know, you've often got um, copywriters, art directors, you've got, you know, you're people working yeah. in pairs all the time. And, you know, I often think that it's quite good to have a complementary mind um, working with you to create your best work. Do you, do you think that's the case or do you think, you, do you think it's just down to the person? I, I think there's, I don't know, I think my entire approach to work is that, you know, theatre directors are very spoiled in lots of ways. And there's lots of work that I watched and didn't enjoy where I felt like the director was just moving people around like puppets to get the picture in their head. And the way that I've always framed it to people, certainly in theatre, is I think any tube can do that. I think, mm -hmm. I think when you're three, you can do that with your dollies. But that the art, is in collaboration, like fundamentally, uh, you know, to me, making is an art of collaboration. Even if you write the whole thing on your own, you're still collaborating with the reader when they open the book, yeah, yeah. you know? And there's so many plays that I've seen where I've been like, mate, if you want that much control, write a bloody book. Like just fight with <laughs> one editor, stop like making everybody else so miserable. So I, I think there is that. I think what is good to know though is, what are the things that are efficient to do on your own? So there is a thing where, because my background is site-specific theatre, which is a very demanding structural process because you're moving from space to space, as well as structurally moving the show, the, the show on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I am a structural, like I'm a structural genius when it comes, like I've had to, I've had to do circuit training, like SAS level circuit training. So when it comes to structuring, usually what happens is Jeremiah will hand me that bit and be like, go be sweary for three days, I'll see you at the end. And like, I do that bit and equally, he does the first blush of dialogue because he's an actor and words just live, he can improvise in a way mm. that I can't. And I might come back and make it sharp or clever or different, but he does the first blush of that. And that comes from us really understanding which of us does which thing well. And, and fundamentally, as people who quite like each other, we tried collaborating on it. And if we make the other one tut for three whole days, we're like, I'm just getting in the way. Eh? I'll just... <laughs> I'll just go. I'll just go. So, um, but I do think that for any art forum, fundamentally, if you're having fun on your own toboggan, that's great. Like, as long as it feels like fun, you should be doing whatever you want to do. Yeah. I think what happens is we think we have to stick with it when it's not fun, when in reality, getting one more person involved or a bunch of people involved will tear through things and, you know, I don't think I've ever done a final edit on a play without my, uh, my actor ensemble. Like, I don't think I've ever, I would never presume to know better than the people who are going to deliver the lines, what the best line is. So I can roughly, you know, I will often write them and then I'll be like, okay, now we're going to have a read through and I just have to grit my teeth and know that it's going to sound crap and then we'll be great. You know, and I think that's, I think that's any artistic pro process. It's like, you're never done and it's always better if somebody else has come in and had a poke about under the hood. Perfect. Rach, do you want to give us some final thoughts? I'm just conscious of time. We've got three minutes. Um, left. I know, I know. Can you believe it, Sandy? We've got three minutes. I think, um, there's been some just some brilliant feedback, Sandy. And people are really engaged with your enthusiasm and your love for what you do, and I think that's really shining through. Just a very quick, um, a quick question on that, or a quick comment on that. And how do you, because you've lived through a whole range of different um, genres and times, and and uh, been involved in lots of different aspects of the creative industries and I know that when you talk about artist you mean creative and artist in its broadest sense and um, can you just give us a final top tip of what people can take away after tonight around just getting yourself geared up and ready for action ready for a day tomorrow if we wake up tomorrow morning <laughs> okay I would say ruthless self-preservation first so like absolute ruthless we don't we're not ruthless enough about yes i'll just do this no we'll just do whatever like draw a line and protect it think of your artist as someone who is six years old if they're going to come out and play then somebody needs to be out the front with a weapon being like leave the kid alone they're playing <laughs> you know so like furiously like big sister furious protect yourself so that you can have like ruthless self-preservation in that way run a worry jar like yes there is all sorts of shit going down write it down stick it someplace make a schedule for when you're going to go and worry about it and then leave it on the desk as a job to do later and 
don't ne don't run yourself up against something that you know is going to screw you up. If you're going to make a call that you know is terrifying and difficult, like have a mate with you. If you're going to talk to somebody and you haven't introduced them before, do all your homework. Like make it easy for yourself because there's no reason for this shit to be any harder than it is. And take advantage of the fact that the world is changing. I, that's the only other thing I'd say. Fluid situations are worrying and scary, but I would rather go into that with a bunch of imaginative, creative freelancers who've never had a safety net. Like, who do you think's ready for that? That or the desk job? <laughs> I think the artists are ready for it. Fantastic. Sandy, thanks so much. I, I want to take uh, all those little, there's loads of little nuggets there. We need to get them all pulled out. We need to get someone to sit and re rewind through this and just pull them all out as, as quotes. Um, you know, as usual, I could sit and listen here for, for hours upon end. And thank you so much. Your, your energy is infectious and I'm sure everyone um, can reiterate the same, um, that they've enjoyed it as well. Thanks so much for spending the time, taking the time to join us uh, this evening. And thanks to everyone who's come along um, to spend this hour. Uh, while the sun is shining outside, we appreciate you coming and, and being part of our wee gang for this wee period. Um, we'll be here next Tuesday again at five o'clock and every Tuesday for as long as, um, as, as, as we can see at the moment. Um, so... Yeah, as I mentioned earlier on, if you've not already done so, take a look at the Creative Entrepreneurship's um, site. Um, if you're looking for one-to-one -one support, if you are in that stage where you're needing help, you're needing just pointed in the right direction, or you're needing a little um, bit of motivation or kick up the bum, um, come on there and we'll, everyone there will try their best to help and support you. Um, also, we mentioned previously, and um, if, you, if you are struggling just now, reach out and there is um, many charities that can help and support like uh, with that. Specifically for the creative industries, there is a charity called NABS. I am now on the Scottish Council, N-A-B-S. It's completely free of charge if you want to reach out to them. Again, you can speak to someone completely free of charge who will help you just now and try and um, point you towards um, you know, support in any way, whatever that looks like for your specific situation. Please keep joining us here um, and you know, join us on uh, LinkedIn and on the platform and don't be scared to reach out. I've found at the moment that you know, so many people have so much more time, um, as Sandy mentioned, lots of people don't have their commute, they're, they're at home and people generally want to help. I, you know, I've had so many people reach out to me and you know, I can only talk about from my own perspective, but I'm, I'm trying my very best to, 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 to come back to everyone and help where I can. But as Sandy also mentioned, be specific with what you're asking. Make it really, really easy. Don't write pages to people because that, that sets a wall up, that sets a barrier to someone helping you. If you can be really short, really descriptive and ask for something, you'll generally find people will be keen to, to, to do that for you. So um, yeah, I just want to say thanks again and look forward to seeing you next Tuesday. Take care, everyone. Have a nice Thanks, evening. Bye. See you Bye. Later. Bye. Bye.